Well, from slow-mo the movie to lens flares the movie. Welcome to the Flick Lab. I'm Karri, you're Henrik. So we're back with the Mission Impossibles, now part three. Yeah! Impossible 2 Cruise. Well, some sources say was kind of desperate to save the franchise. He was spinning around a few directors, never actually being able to settle with any one of them. The biggest, perhaps, or, or the one that got the furthest here would have been Joe Carnahan, the director of Narc, which was the uh, Cruise Wagner Production House's production. Oh, and David Fincher was on the table before that. Ah, but I haven't... I wasn't aware that Fincher was in discussions. Yeah, that was exciting times. Unfortunately, not directing this movie here. Yeah, instead, directing responsibilities would go to one J.J. Abrams. Yeah. To whom, if, I, if memory serves correct, this was the one that actually landed him into... Like like the Hollywood movie career. Yeah, uh, we've been asking basically some questions throughout these episodes. Mission Impossible 1, I guess at least originally we tried to kind of nail into what makes Mission Impossible 1 the Mission Impossible that we know. Well, obviously the answer is it, 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 it kind of doesn't because the style keeps changing. But we did find some... You know, elements there that do carry on into the other films. In the part two, we were asking the question whether uh, this is a masterpiece or this is absolute dog shit garbage. And now in the third one, we're, I suppose, asking more or less the question, uh, is this now the template of the rest of the series or the franchise or not really? And what makes it so? And uh, honestly, I'm not sure if we are even now there because the franchise just keeps re-innovating or, or changing or having a crisis of character. Yeah, yeah. To me, Miss Impossible 3 is perhaps the template movie of the franchise. Not in, in the sense that this was would actually settle down what the future installments will be or even will be like. But in my opinion, this kind of sets the tone for the future uh, installments. We have kind of, like, the later installments, in my eye, they, they have the, the glossy, less lens flare approach from, well, Mission Impossible, well, two, but in my opinion, three kind of, like, shows off the edges. It also takes the globetrotting adventure part from Mission Impossible 3, and finally, you know, ditches the suburbs from this franchise from this point onwards. Well, the Missing Impossible 3 would be the only one that would even bother with the suburbs at all in, in this franchise. This is so crazy, Henrik. I don't know exactly what is being taken from where or what is the distinct identity of all these different agent adventures. James Bond is one thing on the Daniel Craig era. It definitely takes elements from Jason Bourne, and in a way it is also its kind of own thing, but takes elements from Jason Bourne, then it's kind of being Bond some of the time. Then then we have Jason Bourne, Jason Bourne, and now we have Mission Impossible, which in my eyes, in Mission Impossible 3, and maybe kind of inherits it in, into the subsequent sequels, is the Jason Bourne-esque nature of it. A little bit more, like, dare I say, a hell of a lot more realistic uh, than Mission Impossible 2, which I do like if you didn't didn't listen to the previous episode, by the way. It's more like boots on the ground, a little more earthed. The action is quote-unquote more realistic, if you will. There's more character, there's more plot. Yeah, 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 you have all that. But it has that Jason Bourne-esque, uh, I guess, greediness, in lack of a better, better term. And uh, it does have maybe some more humor than the previous installments. So it tries to be funnier 
maybe keeping a bit of that, you know, James Bond type of vibe there, kind of playfulness of the scenes, all in all. Is this now Mission Impossible or is this Jason Bourne? It might be, this most definitely is Mission Impossible. I would say this is closer to James Bond than Jason Bourne. Hmm. Uh, Mission Impossible 3, like you, you ask what has been taken from what installment to get here. In my opinion, not that much really. Like the carryovers in Mission Impossible 3 from the previous films would be, once again, in my opinion, Luther, Ethan as a character, but not as a ba- as a background, because Ethan's background is never touchable. None of those adventures for the previous movies will ever be approached by these later installments. It will take the masks, and it will take the most the the, the voice modulator from the, from the two. But in my opinion, that's that. What, then again, the franchise will have from Mission Impossible 3 onwards would be the, the globe-trotting nature. Mm-hmm. It would have the, the more finally nailed down team of Ethan. It inherits Benji from Mission Impossible 3 and then Benji sticks with Ethan for the next installments. So, where well, there's that. At, at least now, the team has three staple members it takes the more more at times jokey joke humor approach or, or the franchise takes takes from this one also following the third movie i do think that that the franchise gets more gadgetry Mission Impossible 2 had no gadgets at all, if you don't count the mask and the voice modulator and the, the sunglasses extreme still quite quite low tech video camera eye cla- glasses from Mission Impossible 1 and and the the watch TV monitor thing that they have had in one and the exploding bubble gum. They are all gone. Yeah. Not returning. But what in my opinion in spirit gets carried over from three is that the more kind of like the Ethan starts to rely on gadgets more and more. Ever since Benji joins the, 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 the team. And also the gadgets kind of get more and more sci fi is More fantastic. You Especially, is, is it now Coast Protocol or Rogue Nation where they break into Kremlin? I guess it was, was like Coast Protocol. Uh, and, and they have like that hologram wall which they project the hallway into. And then they sneak behind it. Try to... Uh, approach yeah. the Kremlin guard. So those type of gadgets start to seep into the franchise. And I kind of see that, you know, the the gadgets that we have here at 3 are kind of a, like like proto-stage for all of that. This is a kind of a point where it starts to chill up a little bit. Uh, starting to get a better sense of what's the kind of theme of the IMF, like you said. But then again, character of Ethan, when you're going to start going more character-driven, which is, I believe, what the Mission Impossible 3 is doing, character of Ethan, it's kind of always been kind of empty in all of these movies. We don't know anything about this guy, really. And it's okay, it's okay, but it's fascinating in a sense that we invest so much in these movies where we don't know anything about the, the lead character after the movie. He, he's, he's Ethan Hunt, he's Tom Cruise, man, and that's about it. Also, they have made the character more serious here, and I, I think he barely laughs or smiles anymore. Well, he does that, does do that before the mission calls him again. But uh, yeah. it's lacking a bit in Cruise's typical sparkling personality that we have come to see before. In in the previous episodes, I've kind of made the case that Ethan Hunt's persona is some type of response always to what is Tom Cruise's public image at the time. Mm-hmm. And it's it's a thing that I freely stole from Patrick H. H. Willems. But keeping with that, yeah, that framework, now in, in Mission Impossible 3... This would be the time uh, time period in in Cruz's life where basically his charm 
has started to chip off. People are more and more paying attention to all the, all the creepy Scientology bullshit. Mm. The, the dirty laundry from, you know, his previous two, or, or from the previous two breakups, one with Katie Holmes and one, the other with Nicola Kidman, or, or that has started to sur- surface. Over it all, like, like Tom Cruise's weird and sometimes e- even like down like hostile be- behavior has, has started to come to a talking point. So now we have Ethan Hunt. The, the lovely everyman, the trustworthy boyfriend, the supporting husband, etc., 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 who wants to have the, the cozy home life and then kind of against his will, based upon his kind of obligations to those who, who ha- to his few friends, are the ones that force him back into the whole spy life. Yeah, I can't help but thinking when I watch this film that. All of the Scientology talk about him, the goddamn South Park episode about Scientology and the breakups, the public discussion that must have affected the dude. And maybe this is like him trying very hard to show that, you know, he can be a very serious action star too. He doesn't need to be the kind of uh, Ethan Hunt persona that he is here, but he chooses to be. I think he's just. To me, it comes off that as maybe it has nothing to do with it, but it comes off as look at me, I can be also like this, so leave me alone. Uh, perhaps kind of yeah. I mean, following Mission Impossible Three later in the franchise, when it gets more and more reported that Tom Cruise is a control freak, freak on, on the set, and the whole Tom Cruise is a crazy person image has been well established in the in the people's mind. That's when Ethan Hunt one transforms once again in these movies. Yeah. Ditches the wife all together, which is something really special supposed to be in Mission Impossible 3, and Ethan Ethan himself becomes kinda crazy. He becomes job orientated, obsessed, workaholic perfectionist. But just like these films can work as a mirror into into Tom Cruise, I also think that they kind of can work as a mirror into any given director of Mission Impossible films. In this case, it would be J.J., who kind of, w- once again, in my opinion, is doing the heavy lifting here, trying to save the franchise after the second one. And the road that he seems to take is to... Kind of make this weird hybrid between missions one and two. It has the closey action of of this mi- impossible two, and it has the plot structure of the first film. Ethan doesn't lose his team this time, but he does lose his protege, and it all once again points into a, some kind of a super secret MacGuffin. The knocklist of the first film has now changed into the rabbit's foot. Once again, there's a mm. mole hidden in the IMF because it's a yeah. somehow an agency that is completely incapable of in any way seeding out the bad seeds from its from its crowd. The mole front was again frames Ethan for I never actually understood for what, but for something. And once again, the bad guy is some type of a super arms dealer. In three more than in one, Max was kind of a side character in Mission 1. Here, the Davian is the main antagonist. I'm not saying all of this to make the claim that Mission Impossible 3 is necessarily a bad film. To a lot of people, me included, this was the movie that kind of reignited our interest towards Mission Impossible, the franchise. But I do kind of... I, I do make the case that it kind of shines a light into what type of director J.J. Abrams is. Hmm. And I would go further with that and make the claim that J.J. Abrams is more of a director whose skill is into taking things apart and looking at the pieces and identifying some type of a framework from those pieces. And he would be more that that than, you know, I I don't know, something like Alfred Hitchcock or or Steven Spielberg. 
Yeah, just to come back a little bit on the whole Tom Cruise crazy thing. Well, it's easy to say crazy, well, Scientology thing, yeah, a little bit cuckoo. But in terms of crazy on the set or being a control freak, this guy is a producer and, a, and an actor at the same time. Guy who loves films, he wants to get everything right, he's doing all the stunts. A lot of baggage on that guy at the set, no doubt. And then the crazy aspect, well, every artist out there usually is said to be a little bit cuckoo in the head. Uh, there's nothing unusual about that, so uh, it's a bit sad that the guy has to go through all of this framing him as, as a completely crazy person. It would be if it wouldn't be so much Tom Cruise's own doing. The Scientology bullshit is, is its own thing. Mm -hmm. But even outside of that, like you wanted to do, like you point out that he's the star and the producer a lot lies on his shoulder fair enough but he's still the guy who was too intense for Sandy newton on on the set he's still the guy who for no apparent good reason decided to almost poke his eye with a knife mm. at least the scene that Sandy newton was saying in detail about tom cruise was saying that you're getting all the shittiest lines in this scene ranting on about that that wasn't, you know, anything bad towards her, but somehow she took that as a very intense moment, even though it really didn't seem to have anything to do with, about her. But then she started to get a little, feel a bit un uncomfortable. Okay, fair enough. I wasn't there. I don't know. But yeah, okay, intense at the sets. And then there's the other cruise side that I don't, I willingly ignore because it doesn't have anything to do with his business per se. Guy who believes in Scientology. Uh, or is associated with Scientology and says that psychology is a uh, is a bunch of humbug. So. Yeah, and I don't claim, that, but or I, I would actually claim that that's not something that does not show up in his business. My opinion that actually does show up in in his work. That the uh, somewhat hazy shit that he does or has done inside the church of uh, church actually has sh shined up a light upon, well, other people's work. Nicole Kidman's career perhaps took a bit of a nose dive after, you know, the whole Tom Cruise debacle. If some nothing else, you can actually see the effects, at least in my opinion, in mm. the others. And, you know, the following Nicole Kidman features. Like, or, or his public image as a crazy person does not, just limit into Scientology itself. It's it's also the whole jumping on a couch Oprah <laughs> stunt. Oh my god, that well, yeah, yeah, cra crazy going, but quite, yeah. quite, quite overplayed the whole thing. And uh, it, perhaps it, overplayed, yeah. But yeah. once again, if you ask, like, where does his public image come from? It comes from stunts like that, in front and off the, uh, behind the camera, and yeah. off the camera, and off the set. It's not like, it's it's not just that we all look at the fact that Tom Cruise is part of Scientology. It's, like, it's not just, you know, that South Park happened to make extremely funny episode about Tom Cruise. And that would be just, you know, the explanation into his public image. John, Tom Cruise himself has done a considerable damage sure. to his own, own own personal public image. And fair enough, you know, Tom Cruise is a private individual and if he wants to burn his public image to the ground, he's free to do so. But at the same time, you know, well, okay, mm. everybody sees you as a crazy person. Can't blame everybody else for that. But the main crazy person in this film is played by the late Philip Seymour Hoffman, playing indeed the character of Owen Davian. In the whole center of this thing is the rabbit's foot playing as the MacGuffin. And it is in fact such of a MacGuffin that you are not even shown the scene where it gets stolen. And instead, at that time you follow these two random characters in a car talking about cats. <laughs> and we never get to know what the rabbit's food is. That's maybe not important. But it seems to be some kind of a bioweapon if you go by the packaging of things. Same thing as in MI1 and to a lesser extent in MI2 is that, well, is, is that Ethan helps the criminal get what he wants. 
to add to the list yep. of similarities and then has to make him lose it. Yeah, but maybe if you want to say anything about Philip Seymour Hoffman, definitely you feel like this is a character that you should be avoiding. The yeah, so you talk about Philip Seymour Hoffman or Ethan Hunt, who are <laughs> in fact, like, because Mission Impossible 3 really is a movie where a sociopath is acting against a sociopath. That's an interesting take. I've heard some rumblings of this sort, but can you enlighten me? What the hell? Well, name one person that Ethan cares about, if not including his wife in, in part three. Particularly cares about, I don't know, his team. Yeah, in any way. His team who wants to show, join him on this rogue mission as, as well. Well, not really. Like... When has he actually ever done anything for his team? He gets the team killed in, in the first one, in, in the second one. He kind of is like, you stay alive, I get the vaccine. And then yeets the fuck off. It's kind of like, yeah, stay with your abusive boyfriend. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, that's a take. Yep. If 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 something Mission Possible 3 tries to humanize Ethan Hunt... Perhaps as a, some type of a facelift for Tom Cruise himself, who also needed a bit of a humanizing at this point mm. for his public personal image. Yeah, what what better subject than to have the wife in a mortal danger? Yeah, but it's it's like the first time that Ethan has actually cared about another person, risked the mission for another person. He he does like fuck up the mission in, in part 5 for, to save Luther, but that's just something that is only coming up. Or was it part 6? Hell, when actually does Ethan start to care about his teammates in these movies? I don't know, they're about to blow to pieces in Fallout, but then uh, Luther saves the day with the lady who gets rid of the bomb. Yeah, yeah, there's 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 a movie where Ethan gives nuclear warheads or something to the bad guys because they are holding Luther as a hostage. Uh, could it be then the fallout? I don't know. Yeah, I can't, can't remember either. But that that's like the, the reach of exactly how far Ether cares about people. Cares about his wife, they quickly divorces he, her after the movie is over, and yeets her the fuck off, and then, you know, X number of movies in the future, he actually cares about Luther. Yeah, Luther is an interesting discussion point here in you know that one movie yes there are these warheads tom cruise or ethan hunt saves luther and then uh, that results in the bad guys getting the warheads or whatever weapons they were very important weapons very important stuff and then in this movie <laughs> it's then uh, luther again he, he luther basically goes rogue here because he he is the reason why Ethan's wife almost gets murdered. Because when they're on the plane, and uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman is you know, almost ditched out of the plane, Owen Davian, Luther goes on and shouts out the name of Ethan. We can do this much better. You know, he doesn't basically give the home address, but he just messes it up badly. Yeah, then again, everybody messes it up badly, or at least goes rogue. Yeah. In this one. Uh, that's the thing with this. Well, like, s show me one agent who stays true to IMF. Lawrence Fishburne not in, uh, <laughs> in standing. Yeah, what is it, though, Henrik, about uh, this movie in particular? I feel that this, is, this has the quality of being forgotten in 24 hours, this movie. The problem with this movie is often that it's, it's a place of spectacle after the other, but... With, with little prior audience prepping before before that and justification for being there. Kind of this globe-trotting sickness. Again, this is not such an issue as far as I see it for MI1 or either MI, MI2. MI3 just, you know, boom, we're here. And maybe that's the reason why it has this forgotten quality. I don't know if you experienced that. You watch it and then you forgot what it was all about. I don't know, to me, Mission Impossible 3 is perhaps the film that I remember the best okay. from this franchise. Uh, mostly because to me, Impossible, when I saw it the first time, it felt like... like I, I had this, oh shit, whoa, that was great. It buffered me during during my first viewing. It's uh, Mission Impossible 3 is the one that I've seen the most 
of times. And it's also the movie that the older I get and the more times I see it, kind of less I care about it. At this mm. point, I'm kind of done with Mission Impossible 3. But, you know, when it came out, I didn't hear anything. And then all of a sudden it, it was in theaters and I finally checked it out when it came out in, on DVD. And it felt like... Oh my god, they actually managed to save this franchise. Okay. And perhaps because of that, it's the one that I remember the most from all of these films. The, the ones that I I usually forget immediately are Coast Protocol and Rogue Nation. The two movies that I can't differentiate from each other. But yeah. The Coast Protocol has, has the Dubai scene it has Samuli Edelman in it and it introduces Jeremy Renner and that's as far as I can actually remember anything from it yeah that's my thing with especially parts four five six to some extent with with three I can definitely remember one and two quite clearly there might be some reasons for that of course I've seen and by two countless times but there is some quality about three, four, five, six, where I just go back to it every now and then to check what the hell did I actually see, and I just watch them again, and then I forget them all over again. Could be just saying something about the quality of these movies ha- having so much jam-packed stuff and action scenes that, uh, and then just popping up all over the place around the world that it's hard to you know have like some kind of a complete picture in your head why was this character here and then why does he pop up on the other side of the world there but yeah i think there's some qualities about this movie that i kind of don't like the, like the, the last shots of this film the i get this kind of half-assed finish mate of of this movie in the third act your main villain gets crushed by a car i know it's very intentional you don't want to do the whole spectacle that you had in say mi2 and the crew was like what the heck you don't need to do that every time fair enough but you know you have this super bad villain and then he's just crushed by a car and that's it good job guys and then the last shot is where the wifey and uh, ethan just walk away from the camera and the team is hurrahing in the background yeah go on your honeymoon there's different interpretations to this but you know, they're just walking in the slow-mo shot away from the camera. And it's not something like, even in MI2, you have these lovebirds together and they walk into the park and the camera crane pulls back. I think that's way cooler way to end your MI film. But yeah. I, I don't know. I, I hated the ending of, of MI2. Hmm. It, it, it was technically more... Okay, more complex. I, I give it that. But at, at the same time, it was like... You know, Ethan is at park. That there are the children at the background because Ethan stopped the super plague and saved the world, hmm. saved the children. So now you see the children, all the lives that Ethan saved. It was kind of, kind of like, yeah, I I see what you are doing. Wolf. No child left behind. I see what you are doing. God damn. But that being said, yeah, the way that Mission Impossible Three ends is not great either. I'm I'm on board with the fact that Davian just kind of dies at the mole guy here the imf mole that we have whose mm. name i also can't remember just kind of gets shot i'm okay i'm kind of on board with that it's once again it's it's an attempt to in my opinion to fuse together the, the first two movies ethan and davian has a fight much like sean and ethan had a fight in two Whereas they, they didn't really fight in the part one. So they take the fact that the villain and the hero have a fisticuffs fight from two. And they try to take the kind of life just casually ends without a fanfare thing from the first. Where it was just kind of like you're alive now, blink, you're dead now, life is cheap cold attitude and it tries to fuse them together so that they fir- at first they have a fist fight and then Davian just gets run over by, by a car mm. at the mall just shows up and gets gets shot no big deal there yeah there's not a lot of big deal 
anywhere in the film, I would say. I don't know if it's the lack of artistic freedom or lack of ideas from JJ. To me, this movie just feels like it doesn't have a lot of artistic freedom or anything much artistic to say. It feels like, I, th I think hackneyed is a good word, like over familiar through overuse, trites, repeating too often this rights that you see feel in these films and it feels very much like a Jason Bourne film but in an IMF setting and it feels like the franchise is again having an identity crisis a crisis or not it's it's changing its identity and also I, I agree it's a good idea to change the director for each movie if you're then given pretty much free hands in the artistic direction but that is either maybe not allowed here or the first time director doesn't have you know, as as of a distinctive idea where to go, as something we've seen before, even from De Palma. Uh, from from that point, you know, uh, please give me an example. How Abrams does not have an artistic freedom here? What what gives you, you know, the impression that they are tying Abrams's hands? Not necessarily try, trying to put his hands anywhere, but it feels like we've seen this so many times before. That it's it's very reminiscent of all the other early two thousands action thrillers and blockbusters like I've mentioned the change Jason Bourne or even the Pierce Brosnan goddamn James Bond movies. It's it's in that territory in that mixed territory. Yeah, I'm I'm asking because my take is that that's just Abrams. Okay. Yeah. Up until this point, at least. The franchise itself has been extremely open to its directors. Mission Impossible franchise ha has at least been a case where if you join up to direct it, you can have uh, Tom Cruise in and make a Tom Cruise spy film. Mm. That, that was the, the modus operandi in, in the first one. It was also the negotiable point, the case also for the second one. Mm. How much John Woo had at the end, like, like where was he locked out of the editing booth, <laughs> is, is something that we can all theorize upon. But it was stylistically distinct. It, it was, it was. And at least at the, you know, sales pitch phase, it was give, given to John Woo that, you know, you get Tom Cruise and get to make an action spy film and you get free reign. So from the, coming from that background, I would actually be ready to believe that also Abrams was being given free reign over Mission Impossible 3. And could very, very well be. And it wouldn't have been like, like the studio limiting him. And therefore, if there are faults in Mission Impossible 3, they would be Abrams' faults. Something that constantly tricks Abrams over is his weakness to actually be able to craft endings to anything and also that mystery box bullshit that he's all about definitely some steven spielberg toolbox stuff there you know jj had definitely gone to the mcguffin school of spielberg at some point yeah unfortunately abrams in my opinion he takes the mcguffin school and then turn it into the mystery box ideology, which mm. is something that I absolutely hate, or uh, don't absolutely hate, that, that's a uh, hyperbole, but I'm not a fan of, I, I think it's a, it's a disservice, and I th think it is, you know, partly bullshit. Yeah, yeah, don't, don't know if we needed to know what it is, but I guess it would have been nice by the end to just have some throwaway line. Like, oh, okay, it was something that would have destroyed the entire city of Los Angeles, whatever. It would have been nice to actually see it somehow play out. Or if it's... If that was out of the cards, then... For fuck's sake, don't end your film in a way where you yourself address the fact that your MacGuffin is an unexplained MacGuffin. And then... Have Lawrence Fishburne state that if you stay, I tell you after the end credits. <laughs> like don't don't do that. Yeah. Oh yeah. my God, don't do that. It's an I interesting way to play this whole thing. It's a funny thing that we as an audience are 
sort of kind of being played with this MacGuffin until the end of the film. Everything kind of revolving around it, I guess. And, and then actually you don't know anything about the MacGuffin. That's one way to do it. The other way to do it is perhaps to, you know, try to present some kind of a scenarios how important that this might be. I know there's the whole saving, saving the wifey thingy, but, you know, you could have said something that, okay, if we don't secure this MacGuffin, then uh, the city of Los Angeles will be in flames in eight hours. Yeah, that could have been. I mean, once again, to look at Spielberg, Raiders of the Lost Ark. The lost, titular Lost Ark is a MacGuffin for the entire film. And what it actually is, what it actually does, never actually gets explained in the movie. But at the final showdown, it does show that it does break a hell of a lot of Nazis with some type of, uh, I don't know, ghostly apparitions or some lightning shit or whatever it is, but it's harmful. Mm. And it, it destroys the whole Nazi squad. That's kind of enough, but it's mm. too much to ask from Abrams. Speaking of too much to ask from Abrams, the action seems a bit chip choppy and uh, not so hard to follow, but it is hard to follow at some, some sh scenes and shots. Actors are just shooting into the void, you know, and no idea what at. Yeah, we raised it in the Robocop episode where the, the fourth one, the remake, kind of went into that direction that, okay, we're shooting at something never re revealed what at and that kind of disengages you from, from the action because you don't know what the hell is going on. And there is some of that here. It's not that bad. When I compare this to MI2, well, in MI2, I think the direction of action and who we are shooting at, it's always clear. You know, there's the lab fight, the good guys are on the one side of the lab and then the rest of the guys are coming at them. The direction is not unclear and that helps to make the scene feel more dangerous. I don't know, I have kind of a different opinion of, of, of that. It's, it's kind of clear in the sense that what is the direction that the bad guys are coming from. But for example, in, in the Sean compound fight when Ethan breaks out of the compound, a hell of a lot of henchmen just <laughs> shooting at some place. And then of course, yeah, the camera cuts to, to Ethan and, and, and bullets fly around him. But you never actually can tell where Ethan is and where the bad guys are. You just, you know that they are in opposite ends, but that's about the far as far as you can tell. And when there is that, we jump from the motorcycles and fly through the air. And then the motorcycles also fly into somewhere to explode at their own laser time. I, I have not a faintest idea. Not a faintest idea what the hell is going on. <laughs> And then, then, then he grabs Sean into his strong manly arms, gives him gives him a hug, a kiss on the cheek. But yeah, I, I do side with you on the, on the fact that also at times in, in Mission Impossible 3, the action is not entirely clear. And in my opinion, that this is something where, where it shows where Abrams' previous experience with the TV show Alias shows up. My opinion, there is a lot of, of tricks and also some of the faults that Abrams had developed when he was making Alias. At its worst, Mission Impossible 3 actually kind of even feels like a movie version of an Alias episode. So are you now happy with the amount of action here, Henrik? We were kind of complaining that in MI2 you have like three big oh, yeah. uh, action scenes. and Okay, do we have more I, uh... action here? In my opinion, yeah, we do. Mm. We it's it's not as as big action necessarily as it is, but it's kind of how how you contrast it. Ethan shoots less dudes here than he necessarily did in in previous film, but then again, this has you know the the drone bombing stuff. Car exploding from a missile strike and the blast wave throwing Ethan around. You have what I actually quite do like. The first the breaking to, to save Ethan's protégé and then the following helicopter chase through the windmill park. <laughs> and I thought that that chase was actually pretty neat. Yeah, well, if you want to say something about cringy, maybe not always seeing that somebody flying helicopters through 
windmills, but kind of highlights the superman equality of Ethan Hunt and his team. I would say that's one thing that is inherited from, let's say, MI2. If there's something in the merits of Mission Impossible 456 in some terms, it's that, that they kind of figure out that Ethan doesn't have to be a character who can know everything and do everything. As an example, there's this scene in Fallout in the last moments when Ethan is operating the helicopter. Well, he, let's say, pretends that he doesn't know how to fly a helicopter. He knows all the other goddamn things, but he doesn't know how to fly this particular helicopter. So that helps a bit to make the scene feel more, you know, on the edge. You, 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 you feel as an audience, like, oh my god, what can I do? Nothing! You're just sitting there on your seat and... Which is maybe something they could have done more in this part 3, if you go, wanna go more realistic and shit. Yeah, I, I don't think that realistic is ever an adjective that actually applies to Mission Impossible films. <laughs> Actual films altogether, yeah. like any medical professional can easily point out to you, these guys would be dead in, in the, during the first five minutes from skull fracture or something the like. Yeah. But it, it does have the Superman quality, yeah. In my opinion, it bit downplays it. I, I do like that when, when they are first breaking into the, whatever it was, junkyard where the protégé is being held. They actually kind of do the whole scan through the walls thing in order to map out where the enemies are stuff. Tom Cruise convincingly portrays a character being in, in enormous pain when he's fighting against Davy and he has the bomb planted in inside of his skull. And, you know, hey, as an argument against Ethan is a Superman, this is the one film where he actually dies. Like, like granted, yeah, 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 he gets revived immediately after, but this is the only film, he's, he's technically, he's technically dead. Yeah. At, at least half a minute. <laughs> Quite a long time indeed. Gets resurgitated. But yeah, okay. Jason Bourne definitely was a thing. Bourne Identity, Bourne Supremacy came out before that. And clearly JJ took some influence from those movies to, to ground, to stylize the film to a degree. It's not a film that really stands out to you. Like, ooh, ah. Amazing experience, never seen anything like this before. It's kind of uh, combining the elements that we've seen before and uh, has some fun with it. It's solid, it's... Yeah, it's nothing to write to mummy home about, but it, it is a film that happened. It's a good example of what J.J. Abrams is capable of, both in terms of positive and negative. Kind of. Depending on your, your, your stance with Abrams, this can actually also be, in my opinion, a blueprint into all his faults, mm. which are many. Yeah. Well, he's a capable B, B minus movie maker. He knows how to deal with the genre and make money with it. I have not really, I, I, I don't have any much of it, you know. I don't, I don't care about his products, let's, let's say it like that. Um, yeah, he's a, he's a dude, he, he can't tell a story. That's mm. his biggest failing. And the, and the tea leaf, it was on the tea leaves for quite some time. Had you truly watched J.J. Abrams' works before, you would have been able to prophesy the whole new Star Wars trilogy, Rise of Skywalker thing. It somehow became as a huge Surprise to everybody, I can't quite figure out how and why, <laughs> but yeah, like if, if you have been watching Rise of Skywalker, you have been wondering how on earth that mess could have happened, you know, you can always check Mission Impossible 3, it, it has all the signs of the problems that in the end really sunk Rise of Skywalker for so many people. I've seen Force Awakens only once in the theaters, I was like, yeah, whatever. And uh, I skipped watching the second and third part of the new, new, new Star Wars r trilogy. But now that everyone has been giving a lot of shit, <clears throat> as you are also very, very aware, I'm, I understand uh, a lot of shit for the part two, The Last Jedi. I'm actually quite intrigued to finally check it out. It's a really divisive thing. I think it's best new Star Wars that has come up. 
<laughs> yeah. In in quite some times, perhaps even in in a decade. Okay. Uh, the performance pedestal, raise and praise, or flush down the toilet, one actor. Well, I I raise to the pedestal Tom Cruise. Oh, what a shock to the system. Yeah, there, there's, there's, these films are about one person and one person only. Tom Cruise did this amazing <laughs> stunt on a Mission Impossible film. Tom Cruise broke his angle doing this Mission Impossible movie. Yeah, yeah, Tom Cruise, Tom Cruise. Let's go with Tom Cruise. What worked? My opinion, the action at times, the the, the, the spirit of, of of the movie. It's really hard to say what really, really worked. It was really hard to put something together about this film. All together, it's recycling things, putting elements in a blender and providing you a new movie. And that's gonna be the formula from here on in. So, I guess Blender worked really well that day. What didn't work? Well, for me, personally, the, the b- single biggest thing that, that didn't work was was Abrams' mystery box. And altogether, his... He's just his storytelling, which largely ties into the mystery box philosophy. So, you know, given the director's chair, I, w- I would have, you know, thrown Abrams' mystery box out of the window to get the l- latest garbage heap, set it on fire, and then burn down the garbage heap. <laughs> there was a lot of hype around this movie about the whole Philip Seymour Hoffman. Oh, he's, he's the best baddie ever. And I'm looking at this and yeah, okay, great dialogue. He's a f- great actor, doesn't really do anything, just being menacing from a distance, sitting in a chair somewhere, saying something in a monoton- monotonous voice. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna go to your honey, I'm gonna strangle and kill her right in front of you, and Luther Stickle and everyone that you ever cared about. But actually that, that works better than many other things in the in the film. What What didn't work? Let's go with the mystery box, man. Describe the film in one word. For me, it's glossy. This is a shiny new toy car that has five million lens flares. At times, it's it's nice and it's shiny, and you are like, "Oh my god, hey, that's a really glossy car." And at the times, you are like, "Okay, cut off the wax and especially cut down the lens flares, please." Um, it's something like that, trying to be original and. and at the same time, not being that much original to me, I, I will go. I will go with hackneyed, and I don't want to use this in a in a in a, like a essentially too negative way. But hackneyed, yeah, repeats elements that are seen way too many times. Complete the sentence. You really know you're watching MI3 when. Promise me you'll stay, and I'll tell you in unspecified time in the future. Yeah. Well, you really know you're watching. Mission Impossible 3, when all you remember about the film is a guy in a monoton- monotonous voice in a chair hanging from an airplane. Did you like the film? Yeah. Like I said previously, my kind of take with the movie has changed. I'm not nearly anymore as as taken by it as I was when I, when I first saw it. These days I'm kind of actually done with it. But I'm not saying that I don't enjoy it. I, I had fun time seeing it for, for today's episode. It just doesn't hold its shine for me like it once did. The older I get and the more times I see it, even, even though I do enjoy the movie, the more and more I'm still kind of done with it. Mm. And why? Just to wrap it up. <sighs> I don't really know. Um... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Somehow I kind of that the film's atmosphere loses me the more I see it. During the first time, it it was years. It was six years after Mission Impossible Two. I was really disappointed by that film. I was certain that you know I have I was done with the franchise. I hesitantly checked out Mission Impossible Three, and in that moment in time, it felt like. Something really spectacular and and really special. It it felt like it it has the, the staying power of something like an Indiana Jones fi- film. Mm. And the more I've I've seen the movie, I've come to understand that it it really just doesn't. The more I've I've 
come to understand and see the problems of the film that I overlooked during my first viewing of it. Like so many others, when J.J. Abrams started in, in movies, I was a fan of Alias just like everybody else. I tried to get into the Lost just like everybody else. I, when I first heard Abrams give his mystery box speech, like everybody else, I, I thought that it was somehow smart. And I thought that yeah, some type of a code has been cracked. It was only later on when I, when I rethought the whole, whole TED talk, I came to realize that it's a faulty premise that can only re lead into disappointments. And that's kind of when I re-evaluated Abrams' past work, re-evaluated Alias, re-evaluated Lost, re-evaluated Mission Impossible 3, Cloverfield, Super 8, all of that he had done. And I kind of just come to accept that for a short time I was blinded just like everybody else. Yeah, I think it has more public focus because of obvious reasons because of being called a mission impossible film i think it's a like expertly done summer blockbuster but the thing with these summer blockbusters and with many of these mission impossible films is that honestly i i don't know if you need to revisit them they are you know good popcorn stuff for one summer watch it in a theater once and be done with it yeah sure uh, there, there are great actors in these movies. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not finding the, the big deal about this film. I, I think it's a decent film done by extremely talented filmmakers. For me, it's kind of the opposite to you, in a way. I saw the trailer originally. I was looking forward to this movie because I liked MI2, and when I saw the trailer for this, I, I could instantly see where this is going in. I didn't even care to see this movie because I could see that they had lost the plot completely as far as I was concerned back back in the day. And I could hear the Mission Impossible theme tune being very reminiscent of the original one and therefore very reminiscent of the original 60s TV show, 80s TV show theme tune. I, I could see what they were doing there, you know, calling back all the fans of the original ones or the people who preferred the original over the second one and i was like yeah no they're gonna scale it down they're gonna tone it down it's not gonna be what i want <laughs> but yeah it turned out okay but it's not my thing watch jason bourne <laughs> watch casino royale did that make sense yeah yeah okay would you recommend the film i honestly don't know i i, I don't have I don't have your problem with the Mission Impossible franchise, or problem air quotation marks. I I, I do have films in, in this franchise that I I do lo really like, and that I can kind of re-watch. But like, like I said, you know, part three has, has lost its shine on me. It's, it's not a bad film, despite all the Abrams. If, if you can stomach it, well then, it's, uh, in my opinion, it's at times overtly lens flary, but enjoyable little action fiesta. But it most definitely is on the popcorn end of, of the franchise. Um, no, I, I wouldn't recommend Mission Impossible 3. I would say that... Would you want to check out Mission Impossible movies? M my recommendation would be start from Fallout. Okay. And come down from there. <laughs> Six, five, four. And if you still want more, then check three. It's still more of the same. Like, it's, it's Fallout-esque movie. But this is so early in the pipeline that if you liked Fallout, it, it can kind of give you something. It can perhaps give you an okay experience, but it's not gonna really scratch that itch. And therefore, like... From Fallout to, to, you know, Rogue Nation, Coast Protocol. But perhaps, you know, you have come down enough steps so that, well, Part 3 can do something for you. If you haven't seen any Mission Impossible movies, don't start with this one. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a tough one. If I were to recommend 
Mission Impossible movies. Yeah, wouldn't start from here. What my brain is also kind of gravitating towards is is uh, Fallout. Even though I, I don't think it's uh, such of an amazing film that some people say it is. But heck, you know, cool locations, nice stunts. And it's kind of expanding on the whole experience that the franchise has had up to that point. So, you know, technically it's 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 on the better end of these films. It's the film where Ethan Hunt fucks up the most. Yeah. And that's that that has some enjoyable enjoyability factor to to many people. Yeah, and cool cool it, it that it also has these cool arrivals to to places. Halo jumps and yeah, I'm all for that. But to recommend this, uh, uh, to justify why to watch this out of all of these, or to watch it in any case, uh, yeah, it's, it's 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 okay. But why watch this when you have a whole bunch of libraries to check out something more worthwhile? No, why recommend? No, no, no. Yeah, like like you said. If you would have to choose between like Mission Impossible 3 or checking out Jason Bourne, just watch the first three Jason Bourne films. Don't don't touch the fourth one; that fucks everything up. <laughs> but the, the first, the, the original trilogy is is way better than Mission Impossible 3. Yeah, yeah, if that makes sense to our listeners. Yeah, yeah, and, and Casino Royale, better film than Mission Impossible 3. Yeah. Someone would then say that apples and oranges, guys, but fair enough. But that's where I'll leave you. Uh, so, I guess the moment of reckoning put the films in order of preference. One, two, and three. Uh, from my end, one, three, and two. Uh, from my end, two, three, and one. And dear listener, would you recommend Mission Impossible 3? Come tell us all about it on our social media pages. You can also share this episode and the others with your friend, who seems to be a big Mission Impossible 3 fan, obviously. If he absolutely hates Mission Impossible 2, then he will enjoy me ranting about it in the other episode. Any thoughts before we get going here? No, let's just not check out the next three Mission Impossible films because I think kind of have a feeling that I've done with the franchise for a moment. Uh, yeah. This episode, making this episode though, made me think that this is very an experimental phase, if you will, of, of the franchise. And then because of that, you know, you could explore potentially in the future then what it what is the magic sauce in four, five and six and whether they are absolute carbon copies in, in structure wise or not, or if they really have their distinct identities, like these three movies, when compared against each other, at least. I don't know. Could be, a, could be an episode, but it's definitely not gonna be an episode. Now, what are we gonna do next, Henrik? I guess something movie-related. Well, I guess I'm gonna go to sleep now. Have a good one. <laughs> See you in the next one. Until then. I'm still up for doing those Chinese bat documentaries here, Henrik. I'm up to doing Chinese bats in my bedroom. Oof.